Marsha Hull. I'm the senior pastor at First Church, and I'm glad that you could join us on the website today for this message. We've been delving into Daniel, the book of Daniel, the tests of Daniel, and we're, lean, we're learning and gleaning from what he experienced and how we can apply it to our lives today in a very, very shaken up world. We're learning how to be unshakable. We have learned that God wants us to not only survive like Daniel did, he wants us to thrive. And wherever you see that word, that, that word implies growth, it implies prosper, flourish, uh, a time when we can not only just exist and get through the moments or the trial or whatever, but to actually grow through it. That God's using it to grow something in us for his glory. We learned in the past couple of weeks not to conform to the ways of this world, but that we need to tr be transformed by the Holy Spirit. That if we conform, we're just like everybody else. We're like little robots doing the same things, looking the same, smelling the same way, uh, dressing the same way, talking the same way. But God has called us to be transformed. We do that by reading his word and letting the Holy Spirit work in and through us to display genuine fruit from the evidence of the Holy Spirit in our life. What are those? They're found in Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, which is something we've not seen displayed recently. So... Uh, we do this by renewing our, our minds in the Word, by joining together with other people in small groups. We call those connect groups because we're connecting with God and we're connecting with one another. And it holds us accountable to the Word of God that way. We have also learned through some of the tests uh, that Daniel experienced that we are to thrive through impossible situations. There were eight steps that Daniel pursued to get through the impossible situation that he was in. And not only was he to interpret King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the king wanted him to tell him what his dream was from the get-go. Those eight steps are applicable to us today. And uh, I had to use some recently in my own personal life, and they were extremely valuable for me to see things and do things God's way. And it was very fruitful. So why was Daniel tested so much? Why are we tested from time to time? Some of you might even think, why are we being tested all the time? Well, God tests before he blesses. God always tests to see your true character and your true faith before he blesses you. We need to remember this because we're being tested more and more and more in these last days. Our faith is being tested, our moral stand is being tested, and our spiritual ethics are being tested. Will we be a people of God, and are we going to be found standing firmly on the rock with a capital R? Are we found to be true to our God when the heat is on? That term, the heat is on, originated in the 1930s, I discovered, during the, Ama the American gangster era. And it meant that the cops were chasing you, they were after you, the heat is on. The cops were referred to as the heat. And it later came to mean that we, they were being interrogated by the police. Today, the, the, the phrase, the heat is on, means we're under pressure. I feel it. I know many, many people feel it from time to time. We're all going to feel when the heat is on, the pressure is on. So under pressure with a deadline, under pressure with expectations at work, at home, peer pressure. Today, it means any testing of your strength, your resources, and the expectation you have to fulfill it. So keep all of that in mind because there are different forms of testing today. 
today we're going to take a look at Daniel chapter 3. So I want you to open up your Bibles and or open up your app on your telephone and follow along. We're going to we're going to read quite a bit of Daniel chapter 3. And we're going to look at the literal heat in a fiery furnace. This particular story is about 15 years after last week's story when Daniel was to tell the dream and interpret the dream for the king. And many people, their lives were at stake if Daniel didn't get this right. Okay, He and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were now in their early to mid-30s. And the king of Babylon, uh, the Babylonian Empire at this time, was King Nebuchadnezzar, and he had the most power in the whole world at that time. And he was filled with a great amount of ego, pride, and arrogance, motivated his life all the way through. And this catapults us into this next test. So I want you to pay attention, because it's a test that we're going to have in our lives, when the heat is on in our lives. So turn to Daniel chapter 3. We're going to begin, actually, in verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made a giant gold image of himself, 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he gives this order to all of his officials, to the princes and the prefects and the governors and the advisors and the treasurers and the judges and the magistrates and other officials to come to the official dedication of this statue that he had set up. Now I want to tell you right now that the way that these are listed in the Bible is their actual pecking order of that day. The most powerful were listed first. Princes were the most powerful, then the prefects, then the governors. As a point here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the governors. They were serving for 15 years, appointed by the approval of their last test. They got promoted. They were now governors over a regional area. They were Jewish, but they were serving as governors in Babylon. Very odd situation here, but they had favor. I'm going to keep reading. When they had all assembled, an announcer shouted, People of all races and nations and languages, this is the king's command. Anytime you hear the royal orchestra start playing music, you are all to immediately drop everything, fall to your knees, and bow and worship the image of King Nebuchadnezzar. Drop everything, worship me, is what the king wanted. Isn't that the oldest temptation? The Bible says that even Adam and Eve were told by Satan, you will be gods if you do what I tell you to do. Remember that account in the book of Genesis? Well, King Nebuchadnezzar is doing the exact same thing right here. The announcer continued, Anyone who does not fall down in worship will immediately be thrown into a giant blazing furnace. As soon as they heard the music, everybody bowed down before the statue and worshipped the Im image of King Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to stop right here for a little bit. We're going to bring this forward to the here and now, to today. Today, we deal with four things in our culture, very similar to what some of these things were identified in these verses. So I want to go over that right now, because I'm praying that this will change the way we deal with things, if we can identify them, and we can make some changes in, in the way we deal with things, so that we can become more Christ-like in what we're doing. So when the heat is on today, number one, the world creates images for me to worship. They do this subliminally and even right out in front of you. The statues we have set up to honor people who have made significant contributions to society have been the target of violence and destruction lately. We've seen it in the news. Those are not what I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about the images and the idols that we make of physical beauty and the images uh, that we have uh, about success. We worship sex. We worship wealth. We worship success. 
We idolize pleasure and fame and power and influence and popularity. These are not 90-foot statues, but these are things in which we are constantly bombarded with to worship. We see it on the screen all the time. And if you're looking at your image on, on the Internet, things come flashing up to us all the time, advertisements all the time. And they are images to capture your attention. When the heat is on today, number two, we're tempted to create false image of ourselves to impress others. We're tempted to build an image to create a false impression so we can belong, we can fit in, we can be accepted, we can be well known, we can be admired. Did you know that you can actually purchase garments? I want to share this with you. You can actually purchase garments that will make your body look differently than it really is. Ladies, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Spandex, <laughs> number one, where it'll tighten things you want to tighten and then foamy things <laughs> that you can wear as undergarments to enhance different parts of your body. You know exactly what I'm talking about. But when you take it all off at the end of the day, even your mama couldn't recognize you. Those kinds of things. Okay? So let's get back to character. Who you really are. It has been replaced by image. What you want everybody to think you are. Have you ever heard of the cable show called Catfish? I want to explain this to you. Because it, it's a show that uh, you, there are people who create a false image of who they are. They may put a picture of somebody else up there. They may describe themselves as having a degree here and a job there and living here and driving this and this car and, and all of this kind of status stuff, and it's all fake. And it's all to get others caught into the web of a relationship with somebody that doesn't even really exist. This show actually reveals and exposes that falseness about it. And uh, that's what this is all about. Okay? It's false. It's fake. It's, it, it's, it's created to impress other people. Number three. Rejecting the images and idols cause ridicule. This upsets people. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who stood up instead of bowing, they're sticking out like a sore thumb. And it gets them into hot water. Well, it gets them into the hot furnace. Okay? So following along in uh, Daniel chapter 3, we'll see how. But some Babylonian officials used this opportunity to denounce the Jews. They told the king, Oh, great king, we hope you live forever. But the Jewish officials that you have put in charge of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they have defied your decree. They have refused to serve your gods, and they have refused to bow down and worship your image that you set up. They should be burned in the blazing furnace. The heat is on. Their faith, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and their lives are now on the line. When people don't comply to the world, others get upset and want to see people get in trouble. Very much like a little kid who tattles on another little kid and can't wait to see that kid get into trouble. But for Daniel's friends, this is most likely anti-Semitism. Jealousy towards these Jews who were placed in a position of authority. And the Babylonians didn't like that. So when the heat is on today, number four, doing the right thing always makes people angry. When you let your integrity, your display of compassion, uh, character, or any other Christ-like quality show, it's going to tick some people off. These three Hebrew men dared to challenge the king's egotistical pride in himself. He had a rather inflated fixation uh, uh, with himself. If these three dudes were to bow down to the 90-foot statue, they knew that they would be breaking the first two of the Ten Commandments. 
I don't know if you can recall those or not, but I want to remind you, the very first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. That alone does it. But listen to the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Here's some homework this week. Exodus chapter 20 lists the Ten Commandments. Read it. Read it for yourself. Read it with your spouse. Read it with your family. So my question to you is this. When the heat is on, what kind of a person are you? What's going to show up? What's going to come out? When King Nebuchadnezzar hears about three of his governors refusing to bow down, he has a fit. He has what children do at the age of two. He has a tantrum. Then King Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage, and he ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought to him. The king asked them, Is it true that the three of you refuse to serve my gods or worship the gold statue that I set up? I'll give you one more chance. If you bow down and you worship the statue, all will be well. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God would be able to rescue you from my power? The God contest is on. The heat is on. The king is saying, I'm in control here. Today, I want to address two things. What should I do when the heat is on that are right? What can I do that's going to be positive? And secondly, what happens when we trust God in the fire when the heat is on? Those two things we're going to cover. So the first thing is to do things right. What's going to happen? First of all, don't worry about defending yourself. I'm going to read verse 16 here. Follow along. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves in this matter. Just quietly trust God to take care of your attackers like they did. When you're in the fire, God's a whole lot better firefighter than you ever could be. These three dudes were not worried about what might happen because God's got their back and they knew it. They knew it. They had faith in God. Secondly, to do things right. Remember that God has the power to save me. Hear me on this. It does not matter what kind of a mess you're in or what kind of a crisis or what kind of difficulty that you're in. What kind of fire that you're trying to put out in your life right now. Hear this. God has the power to save you. These three said this. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we worship is able to save us. The question is, does your God have the power to save you? We have to answer that question with a yes or a no. There's no in between. Does God have the power to save you no matter what you're facing right here today? Doing things right, number three, believe God will save me. Believe that God will save me. I'm thinking you have three choices here. You can either believe that the one holding you to the fire is going to save you, or you can believe that you can save yourself, or you can believe that God is going to save you. Because the second half of the verse I just read says this, the God we worship is able to save us. I believe in that wholeheartedly, period. Don't have to add anything to it. Don't have to take anything away from it. God will save, period. 
question is, do you believe that God will save you in your fire right now? It says so right here. You got to open it up to believe it so you can own it. But you need to do that for yourself. Amen? In our Wednesday night Bible study group, since we've had to meet outside, we've been circling up our chairs uh, outside the church. And we've been studying in a Bible study from Dr. David Jeremiah called Slaying the Giants in Your Life. This week, we began tackling the giant of worry. And we discussed a verse that's one of my go-to verses. God's speaking here. It's in Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you go through deep waters and great trouble, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will be not turned you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you, for I am the Lord your God. Can you say amen to that number one? And can you say that from that verse, we are going to be going through troubles because three times it says when you go through this, when you go through this, when you go through this. We're going to have troubles. When you go through it, you're not alone and God's got your back. Lastly, doing things right. Number four, announce my loyalty to God no matter what. Daniel 3.18 says, But even if God doesn't save us, we will, serve, we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. You talk about courage. These three men, they're announcing their loyalty to God even when they could feel the heat from the furnace. God will use one of, one of three ways to rescue you and deliver you. He, sometimes he, uses, he, he saves us from the crises. There are times when he will actually remove you or remove the crises from your life. Kind of a, a divine act there on his part. And other times, secondly, he will save you through the crisis. He doesn't take you away from the problem, but he sees you through the problem. He equips you through the problem. He gives you the strength to endure the problem, to thrive on the other end of it. And then sometimes God saves us by the crisis. Sometimes the problems that we see with these eyes are not the real problem, but he uses this little issue to help reveal what's a deeper meaning. So he saves you by this little problem that you're in. In all three cases, God gets the credit. So you might ask, as I have from time to time, why do we have to go through so much pain, so many trials, so many tests on this planet? And I want you to hear this. God needs people of character to display His character. That's a beautiful, poignant statement right there. He is teaching and we are learning. Question is, are we open to learning? Are we open to applying what we've been taught? That again is another test of character. We are being strengthened. We're getting strong in our faith and we are strong in being a part of God's army. So let's heed that. Let's grow in that. Personally, it's been through the suffering in my own life that I even turned to Christ. And it's through the suffering that I've died to self and I've committed my life to the Lord. And it is through suffering that I can see that this world has absolutely nothing to offer me and that Jesus Christ has everything that I need. It's through the suffering, through the pain, through the tests that is refining me. So the king is in a rage over this refusal. And as we read in Daniel chapter 3, verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar became so furious that his face distorted with rage and commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Did he need to do this? No. That's what rage does. 
It's overkill. It's unnecessary. But in the end, it proves that our God is the one true God. Keep reading. Then the king ordered some of his strongest soldiers to bind the hands and feet with ropes and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and they threw them into the furnace fully clothed. But because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire, the flames leapt out and killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. But securely tied up, they fell down into the blazing flames in the furnace. There's a bit more to this story, and we're going to read that as we go through here. But there's a few things that we need to learn from these verses as we move forward so that we can apply these to our lives. So are you ready to learn and apply? Say yes. What happens when I trust God when I'm in the furnace? Number one, God will walk through the fire with me. I'm never alone. That's beautiful. Suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar jumps up in amazement and he asks his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, we did, his advisors said. Well, look now, he shouted. You can see four men now walking around freely in the fire, unharmed. And this fourth man looks like a son of the gods. Son of the gods means like an angel, not human, divine. It wasn't a son of the gods. It was the son of God. His name is Jesus. Amen. Secondly, what happens when I trust God in the furnace? God will burn off everything tying me down. Pay particular attention to this one. Notice in these verses, they didn't get burned. Their clothes aren't singed. They don't even smell the, of the fire. The only thing that got burned off were the man-made ropes that they'd been tied up with. I have a serious, a very serious question to ask here. What's got you tied up? What's an addiction to you that's holding you back from really living a full and abundant life? What have you perhaps allowed into your life to bind you? It's time to say no to some things. You know what I'm talking about. It's time to say no to the alcohol, to the behavior changing drugs that you're taking, the high you get from gambling, the euphoria you feel when you shop, when you eat, when you look at pornography. God is saying today, I'm here, I have your attention. Let me burn off the man-made ropes that you've put yourself into. Let me burn them off so that you can be free, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, walking freely in a fiery furnace, not bound and tethered anymore. God wants to free you today, and today is the brand new day, a, de a day that you get to decide no more, no more. The third thing is, God will give me a new freedom. A benefit from being in God's will through the fiery furnace is you will come out on the backside of it with a brand new freedom. You will be set free from seeking the opinions and acceptance of others. You will be set free from your addictions, things that you've allowed to become your God. Yes, your addictions you've allowed to become your God. You will be liberated. You will be free. You will become fearless in your faith as you witness for yourself the power and love of God in your life, through your life. God wants you to live for an audience of one, and that is Jesus Christ. That you would be weaned off the addiction, whatever it is, and experience to the max the fullness and the freedom that is in God walking with God. 
The fourth thing that happens when I trust God in the furnace, God will make sure I come out unharmed. Let's look at verses 26 and 27. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out! Come out at once! So the three men stepped out of the fire. Now I want you to note here that the king didn't invite the fourth person to come out. He didn't even want to step close to confrontation with that person. Okay, we know who that is. Then the princes and the prefects and the governors and the advisors crowded around, crowded around them and saw that the fire had not even touched them. Not a hair on their head was singed and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. God is proving here that he is the great I am. He is the all-powerful God. They came out unharmed. Apply that to your fiery furnace. Unharmed. You will be unharmed. Number five. It will draw unbelievers to God. Your furnace and the way you display your faith in God while in the furnace is a testimony to who God is and how you live by faith. When you are under pressure and the heat is on in your life is what people are going to remember about your character and your faith, and your God. It's how you display your faith. It's how you live, how you talk, how you get through it. Verse 28 says, Then the king said, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel to rescue his servants. They trusted in him. They defied my command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Verses 29 and 30. Therefore I make this decree. If anyone says anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be put to death and their houses will be destroyed. There is no other God, there is no other God who can save like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. I have a question for you today. Who are you looking to be your rescuer, your deliverer, to save you out of your crises, your fiery furnace? Are you trying to save yourself? Are you in denial that you even need saving or help? Are you looking to the government to save you? Let, you, let me remind you of something, what we just read. There is no other God that will save you but Jesus Christ. Period. Lastly, number six. God will reward my faith in heaven. Your reward will be based upon your trust in God. How much have you trusted God? God gives us full permission to do whatever we want in our life. He gives us the ability to make two choices. We get to choose the foundation of our lives, what we will build our life on, and we get to choose the building materials. Whatever we choose will be tested because the Bible says this in the New Testament. Each of us must be careful how we build because Christ is the only solid foundation. Whatever we build on that foundation will be tested by fire. If what is built is left standing, we will be rewarded. Trust God in the furnace. Decide today to make Christ your foundation and use building materials based on Christ-like character and integrity and honesty and purity that will never ever burn away in the fiery furnace of your test. So where are you feeling the heat today? Are you feeling the heat so strong that you're thinking about suicide? Can't wait to get home to have that drink? Get high? Gamble away money you don't have? Scream and abuse the relationships God has placed in your life?
tear into your spouse when you're out of earshot of anybody else. The heat is on. We're going to be going through fiery furnaces. What are you going to do? Trust in God. Let me pray with you today. Father God, it's tough going through some of these fiery furnace tests. You know that, but you also, also promise to be with us through those. That you're trying to refine something beautiful in our life. Something that we can thrive, grow, and be better on the other side of it. Father God, we give you permission today to work on people who have addictions that have bound them so tightly they can't breathe. They don't want to eat because they need the drink. They have no money. They live from credit card to credit card to credit card, and yet they shop, shop, shop because it gives them this feeling of satisfaction. Father God, replace that satisfaction with the real satisfaction of knowing you. Father God, burn away everything that is not of you and make your people a people of holiness, a people of God. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm really glad that you joined us today for this message. It's a vital message that's going to change our lives. We have some changing to do to comply with what God's wanting us to do so that we can thrive in our own life and in the body of Christ so that we can be effective when we share the story of Jesus Christ with other people. We need to live lives of integrity and character or we're not going, nobody's going to listen to the story we have to tell them about Christ. So let's get serious about this. Let's let things burn away that's not from God so that we can be purified by Him and we can thrive in this life on earth with that great hope of our heavenly reward. Right now I'd like to pray for our tithes and our offerings because this is a form of worship. This is not giving money. This is worship. Giving God a tenth part of what He has already blessed you with, what already belongs to Him. We do this cheerfully. We do it with gladness of heart. So let me pray this morning for the giving of our tithes and our offerings, our tenth part back to Him, and our offerings of over and above our tithes to go to His work here at First Church. Father, we thank you for an opportunity to give back to you what belongs to you. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for what you're doing in your church called First Church of the Nazarene in Sacramento. We thank you and support you through this, Father. So we give cheerfully and we ask that you use it to go and make disciples and to tell people about Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. As we wrap up our time together, we always say together our vision. First Church exists to worship God, grow spiritually, love others, and serve faithfully. We hope you come back for Bible study on Wednesday night as we circle up our chairs outside. And we start at 6.30 on Wednesday night. Bring your Bible. We'll, we'll use it. And we ask that you bring a friend. So join us Wednesday night. And uh, on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., we're meeting outside where we're circling up our lawn chairs. And we are worshiping together, gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. Let me close out today by praying the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Go in peace.